All right. Okay. So we can, I believe everybody's here, so we can call the meeting to order. And we'll start the open session with the recitation of, I'm sorry, I'm joined by Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mrs. Gonzalez, and Mr. Studo. And we start with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we are a little bit behind schedule this evening, but our first order of business is the minutes. I'm going to be going through a pile of minutes. Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, uh, one by one. Okay. One by one. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 1st, 2020 regular session meetings as written. Madam Chair. Mr. <laughs> yes, Mr. Gilberto. Already? <laughs> we did receive one comment back that uh, a comment made by um, Mr. O'Leary, I believe under board member reports, um, should have read differently than we transcribed it. Um, and then it's, it should have read, Governor Baker did a great job with the reopening, listening to the scientists and not to the president. And Mr. O'Leary, is that what, what you conveyed? Yes, uh, as opposed to what was in the what was initially transcribed. So that would be as amended, Mr. Studo. Okay, Madam Chair, I move to approve the June first, twenty twenty regular session meeting as amended. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion, Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 15, 2020 regular session meetings minutes as written. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo. And a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manny Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 15, 2020 executive session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. And Menya Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 19, 2020 regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 24, 2020 regular session meetings. A minute as written. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 29, 2020 regular session minutes as written. I, uh, I second. Okay. I have a motion. I'm going to jump ahead here, you know. That's, I know. We're, we're moving along, though. Yeah, we're doing well. <laughs> I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Minupelli is aye. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 29, 2020 executive session minutes as written. 
Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manupelli is aye. And Mr. Studo is aye. Oh, excuse me. Sheesh, Mr. Studo, I apologize. <laughs> no problem. I, I just, I'm going to catch these things. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my word. See, it's hard because I don't see you all right now. Usually when you're sitting to my left, I can just go right down the line. So I, I'm sorry, Mr. No, I, <laughs> all right. To approve the July 6, 2020 regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Minu Pelli is aye. Okay. And then Madam Chair, I move to approve the July 6, 2020 executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manny Pelli is aye. And thank you, Jane. We have kept you quite busy over the past couple of months. So we appreciate them, all the extra detail in these minutes. We've covered a lot of territory. Our next order of business is board member reports. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, I just want to um, <laughs> highlight what I think most everybody received in the mail this week. Let me see if you can see this here. This, this official uh, 2020 vote by mail. Um, <clears throat> I was heartened to, uh, to, to see and hear that the legislature um, passed legis special legislation and the governor signed legislation to allow people to, uh, to vote by mail. I think it's extremely important. Uh, I had asked the board previously about six weeks ago to, to take a position on it and the uh, majority chose not to, but uh, in relation to the uh, primary and the, and the November election, but the legislature uh, heard from other people, anyways, and, uh, and did the uh, did the right thing. And again, this is uh, extremely important, and people need to recognize that you know this is a marvelous opportunity for them if they're concerned about the, the COVID and the pandemic that's taking place, or if they're just uh, you know not comfortable or not as ambulatory as they used to be, uh, to be able to vote and request an absentee ballot. You know, I. Wish that we had gone a little bit further and they just mail the ballot to everybody, but this is a good first step. And I would encourage everybody to uh, to participate and uh, uh, feel free to uh, can become actively involved. I mean, because uh, with everything that's going on here, I mean, our vote is important and our ability to vote is important. And fortunately, here in Massachusetts, um, we don't have to worry about what's happening in other other states across the nation where uh, voter suppression is, is taking place, uh, actively taking place and uh, visibly taking place. But people need to know that, you know, uh, voting uh, certainly does have consequences and uh, not voting has consequences. And I think that uh, this is a terrific opportunity for everybody to exercise their right to vote. I would encourage them to do so. I want to again uh, acknowledge the uh, work of the legislature and the governor for signing this into law and it's seeing that it's coming to fruition where people don't have to give an excuse for what about have to vote for vote by mail. So uh, do so. I would encourage you to take a look at it and take advantage of it. And again, this is for both the primary and the November election, if you so choose. So uh, feel free to do it. You should have received it in the mail and uh, take a look at it. And there are deadlines on there to be associated with each one, the primary and the uh, November election. So take a close look at it and participate. Other than that, Madam Chair, um, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Walner. Um, yeah, last uh, meeting I had mentioned that I was going to bring together a summit uh, to explore racial, cultural um, justice issues. Um, we did have that meeting two weeks ago. It was uh, attracted, uh, the Hornets Against Hate attracted North Reading Youth uh, for Black Lives Matter. We had a, a handful of other people who were interested in seeking some of these um, some of these initiatives, uh, and uh, it was attended by voluntarily. Amy Luckowitz came, uh, Mary Prenny, Jen Ford, 
Um, I'm definitely forgetting somebody, but you know, the, the people that would normally step up and reach out socially were there as well. So we had a very spirited discussion. I took lots of notes. And so based on the fact that we were ran out of time, uh, we're actually gonna meet again tomorrow night with a few less people, which is what I kind of expected. Um, but um, to actually go over how do you get a town that's 97, 98% white to actually care about racial justice. And so I have some interesting ideas for them. I'm sure they're gonna have some interesting ideas for me. But the goal is to have a movement that actually has legs that will last for years to come, that seeks education, that seeks um, awareness, and to, to create some sort of awareness for the, the, our society, that our town that doesn't necessarily recognize the need, but the need is there. And how do we do that in a, you know, in a, a polite but uh, urgent manner? So um, that's my main thing. The second thing is I live on Martin's Pond. Martin's Pond is, uh, is, has a huge bloom of weeds and uh, various things of that nature. And so I've been in communication with the Martin's Pond Committee and they are gonna come to the board, I believe on at the beginning of August to talk about some urgent needs that they have um, because we can't let the pond turn into a swamp. Um, those are the two things I've been working on, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Studo. Uh, not much to, uh, to say. Like I said, I agree with Mr. O'Leary that um, if you did get something in the mail, first check it because I did get uh, a previous owner's um, ballot as well, which is one of the issues. So I had to forward that. And, you know, I did it because I just... Uh, I take mail in general seriously. I mean, I even forwarded, I, I think when I first moved in here, something that he won a Caribbean cruise. So for me, it was normal. But I would say that, um, you know, take it seriously, check it, you know, make sure you do vote in any way, shape or form, but also be diligent that it is not out of the realm of possibility that people are going to also get someone else's. And, you know, unfortunately, um, like most things in life, 99.9% .9 of people do the thing, and that point one though could, you know, do others. So that's what I would just say to piggyback on Mr. O'Leary that uh, uh, do what you need to do with your ballot, but then make sure that if you do get something else, make kind of an effort at the very least to return to the post office one that didn't belong to you, just so it doesn't get into maybe hands of people that aren't as honest as you. I'll just. Having just in mind today, I'll just add that they do ask for a signature, and when you send it in, your signature has to match what's on file. So there is a there is at least that check that goes in place. So there has to be a signature on file, and your signature that you put on the postcard has to match, or else it gets rejected. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Studo. Uh, Mrs. Gonzalez. Yeah, I have a few things to. <clears throat> talk about um, a couple of things that I would like to see go on the agenda in future meetings. I did discuss them with um, the town administrator and I discussed them briefly with the chair. Um, there's an old bylaw that we have in town um, that pertains to signage um, that it you could say is outdated or the language is just not right on it. Um, basically, it says that people can't put a sign in their yard on their own property unless it's an election, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, which to me goes against people's First Amendment rights, um, homeowners' rights. Um, so I think it's a discussion that we should have. It's an old bylaw that maybe should be brought up um, and, and the language may be changed or done away with or whatever we feel like we need to do with that. Um, second, um, being the liaison for the recycling committee, um, I, I heard a lot of discussion during one of our, the meetings um, that they were not feeling that JRM um, was doing the best job that they could do. There are some improvements that are needed. Um, and I discussed that also with DPW. Um, their contract will be up this year. 
um, probably by the end of the year, a bid has to go out. So we have a little bit of time to maybe have a conversation about that, discuss it and see if we can get some improvements made on that. I have some ideas and maybe other people could have some ideas that, that maybe we can move forward with to make some improvements. And thirdly, I have a personal um, statement to make about a home that was vandalized in town. Um, things were taken um, off of the house several times. Um, people don't agree with what this homeowner wants to have on his property and they don't have the right to go onto that property and take it or vandalize it or do anything to it. Um, you don't have the right. I think most of us know that, but looking on social media, I was shocked at how many people were defending the people that went onto this person's property and vandalized it. I was just shocked that people were stepping up for them. I mean, you, just because you don't agree with someone doesn't mean you have the right to do that. I, I just, I just would hope that most of us would feel that way. Um, and that's all. Thank you. And um, just from from me, I just wanted to commend the um, the group the group that Mr. Walner mentioned, the North Reading Youth for Anti Racism, uh, because they had a they organized, obtained permitting, and had a peace. From what I understand, I did not I wasn't able to attend it, but they had a peaceful public protest that they held um, that was, from all accounts, very successful in bringing awareness to um, some of the racism issues and the Black Lives Matter movement that occurred in this past Saturday. So I just wanted to thank them. This is a the the uh, group uh, led by I think it's Isabel Thorstad, um, and um, so we want to just commend their efforts. And like Mr. Walner said, um, you know, he keeping keeping it going, keeping it going, so that there's a awareness brought to the issues as well as uh, keeping a sustainable effort moving forward because it's not a Systemic racism isn't going away. It's not. Uh, it's an issue that's existed for centuries, unfortunately. And so, any kind of effort that we can take and make to bring awareness and make change of that, it should be applauded. So, and again, they worked with the town officials, obtained the proper permitting to be able to move forward with this. And um, from all accounts, it was very successful. So, to just congratulate them on that effort. Okay, um, that concludes board member report. So we'll move on to our COVID-19 update by Mr. Gilberto. No? Thank you, Madam Chair. You wanna skip over that one? <laughs> you know what, I know we're behind schedule. Maybe we could come back to that later on, Madam Chair. Okay, all right. So let's move on to the quorum requirement. We have Mr. Moderator, Mr. Mur Murphy joining us. Thank you, Mr. Murphy, for your patience. Um, it was to consider reducing the quorum requirement for the May 11, 2020 special town meeting. When we discussed this at our previous meeting, this was required to be publicized. Um, and there is a special, there is special legislation allowing us to reduce the quorum requirement due to COVID-19 requiring us to publish that in advance and have a, a uh, discussion and public vote on that. And is there anything else with respect to that you wanna to add to Mr. Gilberto? I will just add that it was published in the North Reading transcript um, the, uh, on Thursday, July 9th, uh, which was a Thursday following the select boards meeting. And then we published it again on Thursday, July 16th, um, which would have been last Thursday's edition. Um, and that I have emailed Mr. Studo the hearing notice um, for purposes of him being able to read it. It is quite lengthy. Um, I apologize, but I, I did email it to him. Okay. So, um, Mr. Uh, and we also had a work in conjunction with Mr. Murphy, which 
our, our town moderator, and he also previously, he also previously um, met with us and was recommending the reduction in the quorum. And it's to no smaller than 10% of the quorum requirement, which the quorum requirement for special town meeting is, can you review that, Mr. Gilberto? Certainly. So 150, under, right? Correct. Under the town's bylaws, the quorum requirement for a special town meeting. And again, for the public who may be watching, this town meeting was um, called by the select board on Saturday, February 29th. The warrant was signed that morning. The meeting was scheduled for May 11th, 2020 at 7 o'clock p.m. in the Performing Arts Center. The moderator has issued three declarations and then most recently on Friday issued a fourth declaration, excuse me, Thursday, issued a fourth declaration, which would move the town meeting to Saturday, August 8th at 9 o'clock a.m. Um, and his intention is to convene the meeting outdoors on the turf field at Arthur Kenny Field. This is a separate action that relates to that town meeting, um, which uh, the board has the opportunity because of the pandemic and special legislation that was approved to uh, reduce the quorum requirement um, from its prescribed level of 150 voters to um, as little as 15 voters. Um, an important note, and this is printed in the mailed version of the warrant that will be arriving at people's homes in the next few, uh, in the next week or so, week and a half. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it's important to note that it, it, only those who were registered to vote for the May, original May 11th date will be eligible to vote at this meeting. Others who have registered to vote um, after the deadline, and the town clerk is on here, but I believe it's May 1st, um, those individuals will be able to attend the town meeting, but not to participate. Okay. Now, Mr. Gilberto, I jumped ahead um, of public comment to this meeting in the event that we have anybody. We're going to go back to public comment for our general comment, but in the event we had anybody that is attending that had any questions with regard to this, since it was an advertised um, item on our agenda. I cannot see any chat or participants or hand raised because I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, you know, using my, my phone this evening. So I'm just hoping you can help me out and see if are there any hands raised for questions with regard to this particular matter. I'm not seeing any visually and I'm not seeing any electronically in the, the participant listing, which shows 19 participants this evening. That's great. Okay, do any of the members have any questions with regard to this matter? Okay, I don't see any and seeing, uh, I do not see any and um, Seeing none, it's obviously an extremely unusual measure to reduce a quorum. The quorums are in place for good good reason because it, you know we want to encourage active participation and the town rules at town meeting, whatever the town votes at town meeting is instructive and informs as to how we proceed. So, um, but nevertheless, it's it's obviously important in COVID nineteen to um, to be able to to takes this kind of extraordinary action, so. Madam Chair? Um, yes. Could we have Mr. Sudo read the hearing notice for the record? Absolutely. Okay. North Reading Select Board notice of meeting to consider reducing quorum for special town meeting. Uh, this is dated July 8th, 2020. The Select Board hereby provides notif notice of its intention to considering an adjustment of the quorum requirements for the July 27, 2020 special town meeting. House Bill 4777, signed by the governor on June 5, 2020, and enacted as chapter 92 of the acts of 2020, attached here too, authorizes a select board to reduce the quorum for an annual or special town meeting, regardless of whether such quorum is set by bylaw or charter. In North Reading, section 172-4 of the town's bylaws as authorized by section 2-2-2 of the town charter specifically provides that the quorum for a special town meeting is 150 citizens. As background, based upon the orders and guidance issued by the Governor and Commonwealth Department of Public Health, among others, restricting large gatherings and various public functions, and the declaration of a state of emergency in the Commonwealth, the town moderator 
in consultation and conjunction with the select board determined to recess and continue the special town meeting from its original scheduled date of May 11, 2020 to June 8, 2020, then to June 29, 2020, and then subsequently to July 27, 2020. These continuances were done to help ensure that all who wish to participate are able, particularly vulnerable members of our community, were now put in jeopardy. The phase reopening of the Commonwealth has recently begun. However, holding a large meeting during this time must nevertheless account for appropriate safety planning. One of the most essential jobs of town meeting is to authorize the select board to acquire and or convey land. Working with the moderator, town administrator, and other key staff and public safety officials, the town has prepared a town meeting plan consistent with the advice and guidance of the governor and Department of Public Health. There may nevertheless be registered voters who are concerned about participating and who may choose to continue stay at home during the crisis. For that reason, the moderator and select board will meet on July 20th, 2020 at 7.45 p.m. to discuss whether to reduce the quorum as a way to ensure that town meeting can accomplish the important business of potentially authorizing the select board to acquire and then convey certain parcels of land on 412 and 14 and or 14 Concord Street. Therefore, to preserve the option for town meeting to be held with a lower quorum, the select board hereby provides notice of its intent to meet on a virtual platform on July 20, 2020 at 7.45 p.m. to discuss whether with the moderator's input and approval, it should lower the quorum to ensure the town meeting can efficiently and effectively undertake its responsibilities. Such meeting may be conducted via virtual platform of public access to allow the public to follow the deliberations in real time. And okay, thank you, Mr. Thank uh, you, Mr. Uh, one last thing in the bottom. Oops. Finally, it gives all the instructions for the Zoom, this call right here. Finally, it is important to note that the select board voted to recommend to the town moderator, and the town moderator may decide to further recess and continue the special town meeting to the morning of Saturday, August 8, 2020. Notice of the town moderator's decision will be posted on the town's website. Thank no, you, I'm Mr. Really... Studo. All right, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. It was not in my packet for this evening. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. I said, sorry that I skipped that, skipped over that. But okay, so any, any, uh, any, Mem uh, individuals attending, we don't have anyone asking questions or wanting to participate or discuss it, right, Mr. Gilberto? We don't, Madam Chair, although I see that some participants may be participating via telephone only. So with your indulgence, I'll, I'll briefly unmute everybody just to make sure that there's no one who's trying to speak and just can't be heard. Thank you. So I'm gonna unmute everybody who's on the call briefly. So all participants are unmuted. If there's anybody who um, wishes to speak, certainly please let us know. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing or hearing anything further. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. And when we return to public comment, you can do the same for public comment, but just for this particular agenda item. Okay, so if there are no further questions, no further comment, Oh. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> you just muted me. Okay, so um, we're gonna, did you hear, I don't know if you heard, but when we return to public comment, you can do the same for that portion. Yeah. Um, but just for this portion, seeing there are no further comments and no further questions, do I have a motion? Madam Chair, the board having consulted with the town moderator, I move to reduce the quorum requirement. Madam for the Chair, I, I, know, I, I, I see that the town clerk has her hand up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, excuse, excuse us, Mr. Studo. Um, uh, Madam Clerk. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to ask through the chair and um, with the moderator's consent that the moderator does make a, a statement when the vote is taken or before the vote is taken that he is in agreement with this, he approves this reduction, whatever the reduction is, and have that be part of the record. So I was going to call for the vote in a second, and then we were going to have him make his 
you okay. know, let in that that portion. But we can do that now if the moderator would, yeah. if uh, Mr. Mr. Murphy, if you would um, give us it, your. It can wait as long as um, I think it's important that it be mm -hmm. part of the record. Okay, thank you. All right, so thank you, M Madam Clerk. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Studo, can you can you um, well, let's hear the motion again. Madam Chair, the board having consulted with the town moderator, I move to reduce the quorum requirement for the May 11, 2020 special town meeting, which was most recently postponed to August 8, 2020. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. And in further discussion, we invite the moderator, Mr. Murphy, to provide his input and opinion with respect to that um, vote. Well, Madam Chair. Potential vote. Madam Chair, although I'm obviously not voting, I support the motion. Um, I think it's important with, um, I don't want to continue, 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 continue this meeting. Um, so I, I think it makes a lot of sense and it gives the, the community the flexibility to move forward. So thank you. Thank you. And, and again, noting to anyone in attendance that Mr. Murphy has been actually joining us for our meetings and, and actually has provided us with input with regard to this matter and with regard to the town meeting matter. So he's actively been participating and assisting us as we try to schedule these and reschedule these and, and actively uh, participating Selectman. previously. Selectman on Monday, Board of Health on Thursday. I know my agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a lot more meetings than you probably anticipated, but we thank you for your serving service like this. Um, so I have a motion by Mr. Studo. I have a second by Mr. O'Leary. Is there any further discussion from my colleagues um, or Mr. Gilberto? I can see your hand up. Yeah, Madam Chair, did, did, was a number prescribed in the motion? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't have it, but I believe from passage, it's 15, am I correct? It's basically to uh, reduce the quorum to no less than 10% of the number required to establish a quorum for special town meeting. So 15. Do you want me to read it again? Please. Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, the board having consulted with the town moderator, I move to reduce the quorum requirement for the May 11, 2020 special town meeting, which was most recently postponed to August 8, 2020, to 15 voters. Second. To no less than 15. To no less than 15 voters. To no less. Right. Okay, so we have a mo yeah, we, we have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary on that amended motion. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner? <clears throat> Mr. Walner? You're muted, uh, Rich. Aye. Uh, aye. Okay, Mr. Studo? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. And Minya Pelli is aye. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, in light of the vote, and uh, it appears as though we're moving forward with this special town meeting, the special that's been postponed and another special, another special, which is great. Uh, but in relation to the special town meeting, Madam Chair, uh, I move that the board um, uh, for public consumption, uh, the development report memorandum for 4 to 414 uh, Concord Street, dated April 2020, um, the due diligence limited subsurface investigation for 412 and 14 Concord Street, dated April 18th and June 24th, 2020. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. O'Leary. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by Mr. O'Leary and a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Madam Chair. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, yeah, I just think it's important uh, just for the public to understand, and I'm sure they're well aware that we've been you know, doing our due diligence uh, on uh, the purchase of, of, of the turkey farm and two, ad two adjacent parcels. And in order for um, 
other boards, committees, and commissions uh, to make informed recommendations to town meetings, such as the Finance Committee or Recommended Economic Development Committee or the Planning Commission or anybody else who wants to weigh in. I think it's important, uh, I think we all feel it's important that they have uh, the requisite information to make an informed decision. And more importantly, I think it's important that we uh, release this as soon as possible so that the public can take a look at it and make an informed decision when they come to town meeting and vote to either raise and appropriate the money to purchase the property or decide not to. So uh, for that reason, motion is being offered. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I am again motion by Mr. O'Leary, second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And, and uh, Manu Pelli is aye. Thank you. Um, and we're going to return now to public comment. So, Oh, thank you. Thank. Well, just thank the thank the moderator and the and the city the town clerk for joining us. For Adam, this yeah, thank you very much. Helping us through this process once the guy, again. The guy who runs this building has the air conditioning go off at eight thirty. So this is the time. <laughs> so you're out. Have a great night. All right. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. All right. So now let's <laughs> let's return to public comment. Now, uh, for any reason, so, so Mr. Gilbert, I'm going to rely on you because I can see no hands and I can see no uh, chat or anything. So there's a hand. There is a hand up, uh, Sarah Boston. Great. Okay. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to respond to the earlier commendation of NRY4A. We wanted to say that we're grateful to the select board for your support and town officials and community members who helped us pull off a very impactful event on Saturday. Also to the police who helped us with the permitting and were there um, stopping traffic and keeping us safe on the sidewalks. And we look forward to continued action working with Mr. Walner and other community members. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else uh, wish to make any public comments? I will unmute everybody briefly. When I remute, it will shut off all the sound, so you may have to manually unmute yourselves. All right, all participants are showing unmuted. And I'm not seeing or hearing anything further, Madam Chair, so I will okay. mute everybody. It'll, it'll mute you, unfortunately. <laughs> That might be a good thing. <laughs> okay. Oh. Try now. Unmute me. There you go. Yeah, that. it said the host isn't allowing people to unmute them. So that's an interesting. Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting power that you have there. <laughs> it's not uh, shut the mics off. Yes. All right. Well, no, we're moving along pretty well, fairly well. So, Mr. Gilberto, do you want to skip over the COVID nineteen report, or do you want to do that? I'll take now? it up with the town administrator's report because I know Perfect. the fire chief okay. is waiting and. I, Okay, perfect. If he's on there. Is he, has he joined us? I don't see him just yet, uh, but I know I have communicated with him and he should be joining any moment. Um, okay, and this is for the next order of business and for the members, it's page, it's actually page 74 of our packet. And this is to review the fire department federal safer grant application. It begins on page 74 with um, the chief's uh, explanation and information with regard to this grant and is he is uh, chief stats with us I don't see him yet all right well mr. Gilberto if you if you want to re go uh, get into a little bit of this detail this is a temporary grant it's a temporary funding grant that would allow for um, the hiring of um, additional staff uh, the amount that was requested was $3,072,672. Um, again, it's for a specific period of time that the funding is 
available for adding new firefighters to the fire department. And then beyond that, when the grant ends, it can be reapplied for, but beyond that, when the grant ends, um, the responsibility to maintain those positions would be uh, within the town's uh, appropriation. That's correct, yes. And so this is a this is unfolded in a bit of an unusual order in that this grant normally requires a, uh, a match um, during the course of the grant term, that three year period in an escalating amount. But we received notice, fairly short notice, that uh, that requirement was being waived by the um, grant, the federal grant administering agency. And so uh, it's something for which the town has an application pending that was prepared by the fire chief along with some um, assistance in, in this that he identified um, from outside the town. Um, and so the application is pending and we are awaiting a determination. Um, we've not been awarded the, the funding. Um, we've not signed a contract to receive the funding, um, but felt we ought to get, at least get ourselves in the, uh, in the queue. Um, so I see the fire chief is on with us now. Um, chief Stats, thank you for joining us. Um, you want to just give us sort of a, a brief overview of the, of the grant? Sure, Mike. So you, you did a pretty good job already. The, um, the SAFER grant stands for Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response, and it's basically a three-year grant that generally has a, a cost share to the community for 25% in the first two years and 65% in the third year. Um, due to the COVID pandemic and the economic hardships that many of the communities are facing, FEMA decided to waive all local uh, cost share requirements and is funding it at 100% for three years. Um, so the grant that I submitted is just over uh, $3 million uh, for the three year period and is for 12 additional bodies for the North Reading Fire Department, which would bring us up to eight person shifts. Okay, questions for uh, Chief Stats. Mr. O'Leary? Yeah, uh, first question, Chief. Uh, first of all, you know, thank you for showing the initiative and taking the initiative to, to uh, take advantage of any federal grant monies that are available or even state monies available. Uh, you know, my, my initial question is, um, would you be recommending in year four, uh, the reliance upon those additional 12 bodies <laughs> um, for the town to pick up the tab on that. And do you see us, uh, um, where do you see us getting a getting million dollars plus a year additional revenue to sustain the hiring of these individuals? You know, my concern is if we hire them, you know, I don't want to have to lay them off when the grant money runs out either. I want to be able to, do we have a plan in place to uh, help offset some costs, uh, provide some cost savings? And again, it's not going to be a dollar to dollar, to dollar match, but will there be some cost savings associated with the hiring of these additional ind individuals to help um, pay for them later on, you know, when we have to absorb all of them? Uh, that's that's a great question, Mr. O'Leary, and, and part of that is tied into uh, our current negotiation process. So, you know, when hiring the eight individuals, um, part of that plan would be in in uh, engaging the union to basically alter the way we currently do business and put on more full time staff. Um, in that case, we would not be relying upon callback as much as we do today, um, and again that. That goes um, part and parcel with engaging the union firefighters in that negotiations process. And again, have you projected, um, you know, a potential um, offset of the million dollars per year? I mean, is it you know two or three hundred thousand dollars in, in callback that won't occur to help offset the cost of the million dollars? You know, or should we be looking at a, a number? If this, excuse me, if this grant is a, is approved, uh, do we have to hire all twelve, or can we go with eight? We would have to hire the twelve uh, that that I've submitted the grant for. Um, 
projected savings are roughly half a million dollars uh, in, in, in fallback that we, you know, in analyzing it, that we could probably be without. We'll always have some type of callback system. Every fire department in America does in the case of larger structure fires. Um, when we go and assist another community, we need to re uh, cover those people. However, in day-to-day -day operations, it would be greatly, greatly reduced. And, and does this um, uh, require the town to um, provide a minimum manning number? Other than the other than the model that you're projecting here, uh, no, no, there is no, there is no minimum Manning number, um, and there is no, as you've already pointed out, there is no continuation after the grant cycle is over. I mean, I would urge the town to to, to continue, of course, but it's they they uh, eliminated that uh, requirement several years ago, from what I understand. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, um, Mr. Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, any questions? Yeah, um, I, I'm probably going to go down the same path as Steve. Um, when I heard the number of people, I'm immediately thinking, you know, the stress on facilities, the stress on management. Um, I'm immediately thinking we can't sustain, unless we're understaffed now, we can't sustain this group of people after the three years is up. So, you know, are we going to be comfortable with in three years letting these people go? If we can say yes to that, you know, I'm not seeing the harm of that if it's not going to stress out the facilities or, or management too much, but it seems like it's a nice offer, but um, it comes with obligations, which might mean saying goodbye to these 12 people at the end of the day. And um, it shouldn't just be we, and I, I don't, unless you're saying we're understaffed. Don, I'm not, I'm not seeing how we can add on that many people permanently. Mr. Walter, I understand the concern. You know, part of my concern going forward and dealing with the callback system is over the past 10 years, it's not quite as robust as it once was. That's part of my concern. Um, my my remedy to that is to add additional people. And of course that comes with an additional cost to the community. Um, even there was an offset in overtime savings, it would be more expensive in the long run to hire these and keep these people on, of course. Uh, in doing that though, in my opinion, you're increasing the efficiency and safety of the force in the community by doing that. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just a question of how much do you increase the safety? And again, are we understaffed now? Would you would you consider us understaffed, or have you have you? I mean, are we as efficient as we think we can be? My discussions with you, and again, you can change my mind, but my discussions with you is we're being as efficient as we can under the situation. And then when you throw the union into the mix here, I wonder what overhead we're going to encounter there as well. You know, how complicated is going to get? From their end into this whole situation at the end of the day. Yeah, again, all good questions, Mr. Walner, and I do agree it would get more complicated, but I feel it's a road that's worth traveling down. And in my opinion, yes, we do need to add additional people. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walner. Mr. Studo, questions? Nope. No, Mrs. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously we cannot foresee three years down the road um, where we'll be at. My question for Chief Stats is, do you foresee retirements coming by the end of that third year? Yes, I do. I see uh, potential for three retirements in the upcoming three years. And would you be asking for us to replace them or would you be comfortable with having these new 12 people on that you'd be okay with with losing a few? Um, so in losing some to attrition, my fear would be falling back into the system that we're currently in right now that I'm proposing we try to uh, leave. So the problem with that, Ms. Gonzalez, is, is again, if we don't have the, the right amount of staffing to handle 
calls currently. Um, and we start to lose positions due to attrition, we're going to fall right back into the callback type of system that we're in right now. Okay. Any question? Any other questions, Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, no, no, that answered my question. Thanks. So I, I'm going to follow up um, on that question, Chief. So if the proposal under this is to add 12 and three retired, uh, when you when you make the application, are you required to maintain the existing level? plus the additional. So there's how many, how many firefighters right now? We have 21, 22, including myself. 22, including you. So if you add 12 to that, does the grant, uh, do, do the grant conditions require you to maintain 34 positions? The grant requires me to maintain the 12 uh, supplied by the grant for the duration of the grant. So if we lose some due to attrition, I believe we still have to replace those. Okay, so basically you're, you're, you're saying that once you add the staffing under this grant, once you add the additional 12 individuals and you have to maintain the staffing level at 34 versus 22. Yes, for the duration of the grant. So for the, okay, but how would you be even be able to do that then if you, if people retired within the next three years? We, we'd have to replace them. Okay, so you'd have to, you'd have to maintain 34 for three years. Yes. Okay, so I'm looking at the terms of what was in our packet and the deadline to apply for this is pretty clearly May, May 27th of 2020. So are you asking us to consider this for this funding period or next funding period? Uh, it would be in the next funding period. I believe the grant would be awarded sometime late September or October. And right now that's in a little bit of flux due to the pandemic and everything being delayed. Um, and that also could move the starting uh, time of this from July 1, 2021, into a few months down into that fiscal year. So that's still that's still undetermined right now. Okay, so you're not actually looking for fun, a funding, uh, you know, or approval to move forward for the fiscal year 21. You're looking for fiscal year 22. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so now. Um, in terms of the cost sharing, you said that's waived, but it doesn't in the in the paperwork that we have. It looks like it's um, seventy five. It looks like it's seventy five twenty five, then sixty five thirty five. It doesn't look like it's. I may be misreading it, but it doesn't look like it. There's provision saying it's a hundred percent waived. It's saying that they. where it says that the cost sharing is waived. Is that, is that my looking at the same thing and just misunderstanding it? Madam Chair. Mr. Gilberto. There's a separate memorandum that was issued from the, um, the request for proposals that the federal government issued. I'm just looking to find the, the page number that it was on in the packet. Uh, I know we gave you quite a, a bit of volume of, of information with this. Um, You're talking about the FEMA letter. Yes. Yeah, that's on page 83. It's a two page, um, the two page letter. Is that what the one you're talking about? That's the one I was talking about. So on page, is it the D Department of Homeland Security, that one? It is, but it's the one, there's another one on page 146. It's entitled okay. Grant Programs Directorate Information Bulletin dated May 14th, 2020. Um, and so uh, just reading from it, um, um, in response, FEMA is waiving the cost share, position cost limit, supplanting and minimum budget requirements for the FY 2019 SAFER grant program, as well as extending the application deadline Perfect. until May 27th, 2020 at 5 p.m. So th there was a short window, it was about 12 or 13 days between the two 
which is what led the chief to ask me um, about applying. And my response to him was that he should apply, but understand that we were not necessarily in a position to sign a contract if we were awarded because of the funding responsibilities that would come down the road in, uh, after year three. Um, and so, you know, right now this application is pending. Um, I think oh. we all know that the federal fiscal year is, it runs a different um, rhythm beginning on October 1st and ending on September 31st. And so I, I think we initially thought that there may be an award around the beginning of the federal fiscal year um, on October 1st, but our ability to you know, ramp up and, and hire and have people on board, you know, there would be some time that would elapse. Um, so I think we're gonna be in a situation where we were not intending um, that it would be occurring during the course of this fiscal year. But because there isn't a match, if it did, um, we would potentially be able to um, take advantage of it if we were willing, you know, and you know, thought we could make the commitment three years down the road. Um, but that's not a decision. So, so where that's 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 what I was asking. So this this already was applied for. It was so, yes, correct. So this is being brought to our attention this evening. It was already applied for, and I think we need to get. I I have a few more questions for Chief Stats, but I think we just need to get a little bit more edification of what the fiscal ramifications are because we all are recognizing that the fiscal picture in the next few years is pretty bleak so mm -hmm. although this might be a nice band-aid for us right now we, we need to then determine what the pro provisions are with respect to let's say we have to lay off 12 firefighters that was my next question to chief stats is is there a penalty associated? Do we have to pay that money back if we in year four have to lay off 12 firefighters and because we can't afford it? Do we have to reimburse the government for the safer funds that we receive? No, no we do not. There is no uh, requirement and there is no penalty after year three. There's no penalty, but it looks like there's a requirement for us to continue the employment of the people that we hired with the safer funds. No, there is there is no requirement to continue that. That was that's been um, eliminated from this process several years ago. Okay, and then we're talking about um, callback, and although we, <laughs> you know, I just want for the people that are attending or you know participating with us virtually to understand your callback system and if you could just explain the callback system you mentioned fires and what circumstances would um, trigger a callback what does that specifically mean and then um, what what how does that trigger over time I know that's three questions in one but if you could explain that that would be a help too Sure, I'm gonna try to keep it as simple as I can. Um, when we transport by ambulance, it triggers an overtime response by us. So we, if we send two people in the, two EMTs in the ambulance, we hire back two people to maintain our shift staffing of five. Um, when we have high risk occupancies like um, the nursing home or an apartment complex, uh, that we get the fire alarm for, that triggers a box alarm callback where the entire staff is called back uh, to the department in case there is a, an incident there. And with those, with those occupancies, we truly don't have the time to wait and wait for the first engine to get there to determine that, yes, this is real or no, it's not real because we need people and we need a lot of people quickly in case it is something so we can mitigate that problem. Um, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. If we go mutual aid to another community for a fire, we replace the duty crew that left, and that's four people, an officer, and three firefighters. So what we're, we're personally doing with that type of callback is replacing the on-duty staff of five in total, but four that actually leave, leave the fire department to respond to calls. So what about in the, in the case of a callback for a potential fire incident where it's open to the entire department? Yes, and that's incidents like fires or uh, auto, uh, motor vehicle accidents that require extrication or anything, anything that would uh, overtax the on-duty crew or that we would need more resources, we transmit a box alarm and the entire department 
comes back to assist. Okay, so in, in what circumstances does that generate overtime? All of those circumstances, in what circumstances it just, does it generate the most overtime? All of those generate overtime. Um, as you guys were aware, where you know, EMS calls uh, monopolize uh, our, our responses over 50%. Um, and again, with those high hazard occupancies, we don't have the staffing in place in the advent that it is something, uh, a real incident, a real fire, uh, something hazardous that we need to mitigate. We need bodies quickly to help. Um, and that's why we transmit box alarm for that alarm. Box alarm for that alarm for that alarm. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. I think um, I'm all set with I'm my questions. With my I, question. I can hear feedback for some reason. Um, Mr. O'Leary, I see your hand up. Yeah. Just um, would these uh, firefighters that we hire under the grant program have a different status, say like a provisional status, uh, as opposed to full status as a regular firefighter? And I'm just thinking about for hiring purposes, and we talked about the uh, uh, backfilling of positions during this three-year period um, when people treat, you know, and retire? Um, because, or is it, would it be a last in, first out if layoffs were, were required? In other words, you know, someone retires in year three and the grant isn't up yet, you hire some of the backfill, you know, is that person part of the original contingency force or is it a part of the provisional or are they treated the same as any other firefighter and it would be lost in first out as far as uh, any layoffs? You know, that's a great question, Mr. O'Leary. And I would say that their status isn't any different. They go through the same process as, as a, a, a regular hire, for lack of a better term. Um, but where they were hired under the grant, and I would have to research this, I would think that they would be subject to um, layoffs first. But I would have to look at that. Yeah, I, I think that's a point. I'm on my seniority. Yeah, does that affect their seniority, or is it a year four where they actually then uh, start their status? Or I mean, that, that's sort of important to understand, uh, just for their information, first and foremost. Uh, and then the other thing is, is you know, has the union offered a, a position on the grant application, as far as um, a willingness to to work with you to to help implement it? No, there is nothing on the grant application for a, uh, a union sign off. No, I just didn't know if you had had conversation with the union and whether they had an opinion or not and it had offered an opinion or been asked an opinion, let's put it that way. I did talk to them about it. I did inform them that I, I was completing this grant. Um, so they were interested and they were interested in what the town's response was. Well, well obviously, I mean, as we're, we're talking about, you know, increasing the uh, manpower, potentially woman power uh, at the fire department. Um, I, I, in order to continue to operate the way that we are with the current uh, restraints, it would be difficult because the callback, uh, I mean, can, can we change the callback system uh, unilaterally or does it have to be negotiated? I believe that it, it all needs to be negotiated with the union. Okay. Because, you know, that, that's certainly, if you bring out 12 new people and we have to continue to operate under the current system, we're just incurring a significant amount of uh, additional uh, callback costs associated with that. So, okay. Thank you. Well, I, I just, I, I just want to add, I am, I am a little familiar with civil service law and the fire department is still um, civil service, unlike our police department, but a provisional. So in other words, in order to make these hires, you're, you're pulling from a requisition list from civil service. Provisional appointments has a special, uh, it's a special designation under the statute for when there isn't an available eligible list, you can provisionally appoint, but these would to these would to me there's no reason to think under the safer grant you're gonna they're not gonna comply with a follow civil service which is usually layoff by seniority um, you know unless there's something else in the CBA that we're missing that's 
that that we've otherwise agreed to, but so we there, still would have to. Yeah, I, I concur. That was the reason for my question was, you know, where do they fall in relation to, you know, the civil service? And then if we can't afford, you know, is it the last in first out? And it probably would be. Rather yeah. than just because the funding source was the grant money doesn't change their status as a firefighter. Right. Right. That's but right. I, I, think, I think we need that clarified. Okay, and Mrs. and we can we could probably we could probably have a review of that grant and more more specific information. <laughs> Mrs. Gonzalez, I can see your hand you. up. So, so Larry, were you done with your questions? I'm sorry. Were you all set with your the, questions? The only other question I have is just to follow up to Rich was, you know, what do we do as far as, far as housing? You know, three or four different people, or additional people on a shift is our current facility. Well, we already know it's not suitable, but it would be less suitable. But is it physically possible to expand the size of the shift appropriately and house them in the current fire station? You know, in, in the short term, I think we could absorb things as long as we were moving towards either a renovation or an addition at the current fire station if we were going to stay there or we're moving towards a, a secondary substation somewhere. Um, I believe in the short term we could absorb it. It would not be ideal by any stretch. But if we were moving towards a, a different or another structure, we could, we could make it work in the short term. And that, that, just to follow up, that's because, just for the listening public, that's because of the nature of the shifts require you to have, um, you know, basically housing. So they're 12, 12 hour shifts, right? Two tours, two. 24 hour shifts. Excuse me. Yeah, two 12 hour, yeah, two 24 hour shifts. So the nature is such that it would require sleeping quarters and, you know, think that, that that's what we're talking about sort of round, round the clock, round the clock quarters that can accommodate that number of individuals living there. Right, Chief Stats? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay, Mr. O'Leary, you all set? Any uh, other? Uh, just one little follow up again, and sorry, Leanne, was just in relation to the, <laughs> just in relation to the, just in relation to the, the, to the shifts, I mean, is, is there, uh, a possibility of suggesting different shift patterns in order to alleviate the concern for or the need for overnight 24 hour shifts, obviously. And does that, is there a model that would work? It's something that I would have to look at, Mr. O'Leary. Um, again, one of those, another one of those items that I believe would have to be negotiated with the union if they were. Um, accepting of that not then we'd have to we'd have to find a way to make it work well, okay but the, the thing is, is we shouldn't be forced to to build a new fire station because of a schedule issue when we have another mechanism to to meet the needs of the community well right. okay so I, I think we still we still have a little bit of questions, but I, I we do we should probably move on and and let's get Mrs. Gonzalez. <laughs> I, I didn't mean I didn't mean move on from the topic yet. I meant move on so we can have move on other. From me. I, get it. <laughs> so, I don't want to say that, but Mrs. Gonzalez, I can I can actually see the two of you. I can't see anybody else. But all right, Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, opportunity to just address that really quick. Um, if we were to, to, to alter our shift patterns, with that level of staffing, it would require even more bodies. If we were to go to anything other than a 24 or a 10 and a 14, and even in a 10 and a 14 schedule, we're still accommodating that overnight shift. So it would, it would take even more men or persons to, to accommodate that anything other than a 24 or a 10 and a 14. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez. Are you sure? That's pro that, would, <laughs> that probably is gonna lead to 15 more questions, but that's all right. That's what we're here for. 
I'm going to try to word this. Um, it's a little, I'm trying to get it right in my head. Um, so we're going to hire 12 new people. They are going to be covered. Their salary is going to be covered for three years. We have to keep those 12 people on for that three years. If one of them leaves for whatever reason, as I understand it, we would have to replace them to continue to receive the grant. My question is, if somebody who's already active is going to retire, and now the number's gonna change and there's not gonna be 34 people, but they weren't part of the grant hire, do we have to replace that person or lose the grant? Are we gonna be forced into hiring someone else if we really don't have the funds to do it, even though they weren't part of the grant um, to keep that number 34 for the three years? Ms. Gonzalez, I'm gonna say right now that I believe we do. I wanna research that further because that's a great question. Um, right. right now, replacing that person through, um, through the normal process, we would have the funding for it because we would, he, he would be a budgeted person. Okay. Thinking, you know, the normal five person uh, shifts that we currently have. Mm -hmm. so the 12 is in addition to that. And I believe we, still, we would still have the funding for that position. Okay. I'm just thinking down the road. I know that we're going to be, everybody is going to be it, living very tightly um, in the next few coming years. And we've discussed that a lot with COVID. Um, we're all going to have, have to give up a little bit. So um, it's just my concern about budgeting, but so, I just don't, I don't want to be held to something that we might not be able to afford to be held to. Yes, I, am. I understand completely. After the three year window is up, there is no performance requirement to keep these individuals okay. as much as I would urge, obviously the town to yeah, do. Yeah, right, right. Like I said, we just don't know. We can't foresee what's going to happen three years down the road. I have a question okay. for Chief Stats. That's okay, okay. Madam Chair. Mr. Mr. Studo, yes. Uh, uh, I was trying to figure out, but maybe you can just clarify, is, let's say we cannot, for whatever reason, replace, is the, is the payback or loss of grant prorated? Like, so for example, we have to maintain 12 more, but for whatever reason, to retire and we can't add to, yeah. you know, yeah. quick enough, is that prorated or is there, you know, an all or nothing penalty or repayment? I believe as long as we're trying to work to replace, we can request waivers through FEMA and the local director. Um, yeah. you know, that's been done in the past. That's been done to even extend the hiring process because as Ms. Manifelli said, the civil service list sometimes becomes exhausted. <laughs> it's actually not possible to hire the number that people have been granted the award for. Um, so as long as we're transparent with the uh, FEMA uh, local office, they're very willing to work with us as long as we're showing what we're doing to try to mitigate that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other, Mr. Mr. O'Leary? Is there, uh, with the addition of 12 uh, new firefighters, is there, can we anticipate a budget request for change in structure of officer structure with additional, whether it be lieutenants, additional captains, additional deputies? Um, yes, I would. I would be uh, requesting for at least four more officers in the, in the lieutenant's grade. Um, something we don't currently have, and I, I fall back on, on some basics on span of control. You know, span of control. You can't you can't manage more than seven people and three to five ideally, and that right there is an engine company basically. So we have four four man engine companies, a captain on one and a lieutenant on another. 
So then what's the additional cost that we can anticipate in the change of the officer structure should we take on these 12 additional firefighters? I believe it's an 11% 11% increase in that. Which which amounts to what? I'd have to do the math, Mr. Oler, I don't have that in front okay, of me. Okay, but okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so. Uh, Mrs. Hurlbut has her hand up. Okay, thank you. I can't see that. Mrs. Hurlbut. Um, yeah, Chief Stats, in the past, when we've talked about increasing the size of the fire department, uh, one of the issues has been that almost, almost, no matter how many people you had, you still have overtime issues. Uh -huh. You've got to cover vacations, you've got to cover sick days, you've got to cover this, you've got to cover that. So it's not really, as, as I understand it, that we're home free and we're out of a lot of the overtime business, et cetera. Um, have you looked at, uh, I mean, so this is not just 12 firefighters for free for three years. I understand the benefits are included in the grant, but are there other expenses, for example, the office structure that you just talked to Mr. O'Leary about, um, the potential overtime and vacation, et cetera, coverage that will increase, if nothing else. So have these numbers been run in such a way that we have a fairly good feeling about what the cost to the town over the next three years might be? I have not run those, those numbers, Mr. Robert. Their costs for their first three years are covered by the grant, as you already pointed out. Um, their benefit package is covered by the grant. Uh, the only thing that isn't covered by the grant for them is overtime. That's it. So I have not run those numbers out. Uh, they'd be given two weeks vacation, and that's I can have those figures for you at, at a later meeting if you'd like. Yeah, it seems to me that there are uh, a couple of different um, add-on cost-wise for the town that are not covered by the grant that you know we should probably look at. And then for the uh, board, the uh, facilities master plan committee, um, which is in sort of uh, standing still at the moment because of COVID-19 and the fact that we really can't go around and run around buildings and talk to employees and find out needs at this point. But one of the top priorities was a look-see on developing additional space at the firehouse. So, don't know if that helps you at all. Okay, anybody else have any questions, comments? I'll just Mr. Gilbert, can you see, can you see anyone's Mr. hand raised? Or? Mr. Walner. Yeah, so just, just some of the themes, you know, the facilities, the impact on the facilities, how they're gonna be housed, it's gonna be stressful, you know, changing a whole, management structure, how we do business for three years, even if we laid them off after three years, you've built this whole new structure and then you'd have to rewind it to, I mean, 12 people on top of 22 is a huge impact. That's not a small impact, that's a huge impact. You know, I, I love the idea of getting something for nothing and mm -hmm. you know, it'd be great, but I just, all I see is a lot of impact and so to everybody's point, without a little bit more math or a little bit more details behind here, I'm, I'm leery of uh, dipping my toe in the water and, and getting burned because I, I just don't see a good outcome at the end of the three years. Unless you said, unless you said, you know, we're going to bring them on for project work for three years, and then at the end of three years, we fully anticipate letting them go, and we're not going to change our structure, but we can get some sort of proofs to some new plans or training or something like that. That would that would start to make more sense to me, but I, I can't see how we can increase staff by. 50% and not have to rewind that at the end of three years on, on many different levels. Um, that's my biggest concern. Well, well, I guess in speaking about that, that's a great point. Um, my concern has been what type of department we're trying to build towards. Um, our run in call volume has done nothing but increase annually. Um, the ambulance is busier than ever. Uh, our callback system 
is taxed. Is taxed. So the men are devoted to the system and to the town, to the community, but it's been functioning this way for many, many years. And again, with the amount of calls that we continue to go on and it's increasing, I believe that this is a great opportunity to build a department towards something that's more sustainable. And it's a great three year window. Um, an award that, you know, if we were fortunate enough to get it, gives us time to plan and to move in that direction. So, so Don, just to reply to that, I, 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 I'm always for department heads um, bringing forth better plans that meet what you believe to be future needs. It's just commingling the two to me is, is a hard discussion. So I, you know, if you really feel like the staffing is not appropriate or needs to change, I for one would love to hear that proposal um, separate of this discussion because I think we should look at that as a pure play is that's a responsibility of the town to provide the best services we can, obviously with some budget budgetary limitations. So I would want to know that that information thoroughly. So and then we can you know think more about how this might impact that. But coming kind of doing it reverse, it's hard for me to absorb and um, it, it, we should always be pursuing a better model with or without this, this, um, without this, this offer. Certainly not ideal, Mr. Warner. I agree with you hundred percent and kind of, um, tail wagging the dog, so to speak in this. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest with you, when the safer grant was first, uh, released, I didn't apply for it based on the cost share, based on where we were probably heading as a community due to the pandemic. Um, what really led me to um, reconsider that and bring it to the town administrator's attention is something that he had already pointed out where the federal government eliminated the cost share to the community. I felt it was, and I certainly wanted to bring it up because I thought it was important to, um, to discuss. Yeah, no, it's a great offer. I mean, there's no doubt it's a great offer. Just how it impacts us, you know, is obviously there's, there's issues that you obviously share as well. So in terms of proceeding with this, I, I know we, we understand that the application is pending, but we, we probably need to have some more financial data for, for the board to make a determination. And then the other logistics, obviously, there's some, several raised by the, my colleagues with regard to this. Um, so it, there's other housing logistics, scheduling logistics. So we probably need, uh, lots of moving pieces we, we need more data so um, if we can address this at another meeting to in further follow-up to you know you kind of have a, have a sense mr. Gilberto and chief stats of the questions that we're trying to grapple with and trying to sort through so that maybe we can get some more information and data thank you for including everything that you did in the packet it, it is it is helpful um, but for anyone that's watching, we, we get a, you know, that, that was 181 pages of a packet that we have to read this weekend before I'm eating. <laughs> so, you know, we, we're, we're pretty adept at being speed readers, but we need to really focus in on the, the more subtle details that aren't so subtle as we've raised this evening. So, so let's um, continue this discussion further because uh, I don't think that we're sold on the idea of just, you know, moving forward until we get all those pieces in order and information and certainly a financial overview that we'll probably have to have our finance director weigh in on. So Mr. Studo um, has his hands up, Madam Chair. Oh goodness, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Just I can't uh, one last see question. You. I apologize. Mr. No, Studo. no, that's fine. One last question while for uh and not to be answered now, but you know, to piggyback on what you said for later purposes a later meeting I think that and I don't even know how this is if this is possible again I'm kind of new to a lot of this but I think if we before we go ahead with this either an exit plan or continuation plan after three years has to be good faith predetermined and all parties involved meaning that if it's determined that we can only go through this, if one of the options in year four is that we need to lose X number, there that needs to be addressed prior. 
And then if it's a continuation plan, then that gets a little bit more difficult because then we at least have to have an idea based on where we think budgets are headed in the next two to three years of whether or not that is even feasible. So I, I mean, in my opinion, that's something that needs to be addressed because then at that point, um, if the dog wants to take its tail back, no one can say, I didn't know, because that's what usually happens. I didn't know. We never said this. How come no one brought it up? Now we got to stick with it. We have to do X, Y, and Z because we're here. No, I feel like it's got to be something where predetermined all parties involved at least have to go into it understanding that if this doesn't work out, we should have an exit plan. And anyone who says, well, why wasn't this brought up three years ago? We can say, aha, but it was, and you knew about it. And now I don't want to hear it either way, continuation or exit. But I think that's something that if it can be addressed, I mean, should be part of, you know, for me anyways, I'd want to see, I'd want to see that before I could, you know, in good faith vote one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Chief Stats, and, and uh, for the information. I think we are going to need to have more information on this topic, even though we've talked about it for quite a, at length this evening, but I think we do need to revisit it. Mr. Keller. Mr. Keller. Mr. Gerbauer, I'm going to rely on you to let me know who still has their hand raised. Okay, if you Keller. see it, let me know because I can't see participants. So Mr. I'm Keller. so sorry, Mr. Kelleher. Don? And he's done mute himself. He's muted. He's muted. <laughs> <laughs> you, you probably can't see me anyway because I'm outside and it's dark. Um, it is dark. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I would ask that, that, that the chief, probably in conjunction with, with the, the finance director do, <laughs> is to cost out the 12 positions over three years with the salary, benefits, um, equipment that they will have to have, and mm -hmm. some guess as to raises. So we could see, you know, a, a million dollars a year will not be a million dollars in year three for no other reason than salaries are going to increase. And I don't know what the, the salary assumption is for these 12 people, but I think we ought to build that with the 12 people, what the going in salary would be now, what all of the attendant costs of having 12 new firefighters would be, and then project that out over the, the, the subsequent yeah. Years, so we know that in in year three, is it still a million dollars, or is it a million two, or is it some other number? And and if that's the case, uh, then we're going to have to make some contribution just for those twelve. That's that that would be my request. Okay. We'll get that done. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else, Mr. Gilberto, that want, has their hand raised or? I don't see any, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay. So we have a little bit of work to do. Bit of work to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Next order of Next business. Next order of business. Uh, I can uh, hear I some can feedback, hear some Mike. Feedback. I don't know why that is, but. Um, Mr. Mr. Gilberto, our next order of business and to the members, approve the order of taking for the water rechlorination facility, 303 Main Street. Uh, this is a vote to approve and authorize the chair to sign. Madam Chair, so uh, I believe we have agreement as to the final modification for the plan that is associated with this uh, order of taking, but uh, I just was unable to, to get my hands on a signed paper copy, so I'm going to ask if you just I hope for one last time pass this <laughs> over so that we could take a vote on uh, on August third. Oh boy! Rest All right. That we, we do believe we have agreement with uh, the property owner. He's been very cooperative, um, and that we have actually bid out um, and opened the first round of filed sub bids for the construction that needs to take place um, at that site. So that the project is moving along, um, and this is uh, the last component of it, which I, I think we should be able to address on August third. Okay. 
Okay. Well, we appreciate you keeping it on the agenda and keeping us apprised of it. So we'll pass that over. And our next order of business is legal bills. Madam Chair. Um, oh. Mr. Stuto. Madam Chair, I just wanted to offer just a quick piece of information. So um, you know, we've talked all along about the uh, some of the unforeseen expenses that have come up with regard to legal bills. You know, I do want to just, uh, you know, for the interest of full transparency, um, you know, the, the legal expenses will run into deficit, but they will run into deficit um, associated with the COVID-19 expenses. And as you're aware, the board approved deficit spending at the uh, toward the end of the fiscal year. And we'll work with the uh, accountant to uh, address that as we close the year out. So I just just offer that to be upfront. Um, we did get a transfer from the finance committee um, in uh, late May or early June that uh, would cover any of the other expenses that were um, that were not COVID related. Um, and so we appreciate that. But I just I just note that more for the record than anything else. So, Mr. Gilberto, is that um, piece of additional expense that was unanticipated due to COVID-19 reimbursable under the funds, the CARES Act funds? I believe that it is, yes. And we also have some expenses that are dry, that they are inflating um, the expenses booked against the town council line that are water related that actually can be paid from some water appropriations that we have as well. We need to make those, um, those uh, transitions from an accounting standpoint and that'll further ease the pressure on these. But to those COVID expenses, yes. Okay, that's good. Okay, so our now now we're moving on to uh, votes on the legal bills. Okay. Mr. Uh, Studo. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for June 2020 in the amount of $24,160.50 as follows. General, $9,399. Labor, $13,435.50. 20 Elm Street, 1,111.50. SSBC, $214.50. And the total is 24,160.50. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing <coughs> none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Please mute it. Mr. Walner? Hmm. Hmm. He's showing as unmuted. Oh, now he's yeah. showing as muted. Now I'm muted. So um, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 I, I don't know what happened. All right. Yes. All right. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Mr. Walner is aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. Do we have another motion, another legal bills motion, or is that all set? That's it. Okay. So now we're moving on to the town administrator's report. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, I will uh, begin with the um, COVID-19 report, which we passed over earlier in the, um, in the agenda this evening. Um, so as of last Thursday, which is the last update we were provided um, to the Board of Health. It, our total case count was 203 cases, which included 140 residents and 63 patients at or associated with Royal Meadowview Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. 181 cases have recovered and the Health Department continues to monitor eight cases, 13 confirmed cases, which include 12 at or associated with Royal Meadowview Nursing and Rehabilitation Center as well as one suspected case are deceased. And the health department is monitoring an additional 12 probable cases. Uh, town has received an order of facial coverings and they are available um, for those who are 60 or older or at high risk for severe illness by calling 978-664-5600. And we'll be, we will be announcing very shortly a date for a drive up distribution event to occur in August, which would supplement home delivery that occurred uh, in the middle part of June. Residents are advised that and reminded that there is a safe word home advisory um, in effect and that information is available on the state website. We also have links on the town website for resources and guidance for small businesses. 
um, um, are also being offered by the state as well. And we anticipate that the next update will be offered on Thursday, July 30. And with regard to the remainder of my report, oh, excuse me, sorry about that. I am pleased to report to the board and the community that uh, a regional micro enterprise relief program grant application that the town worked with um, a number of other communities for has been um, awarded. Uh, the town would receive uh, potentially $210,375, which would go to qualifying businesses in North Reading. Some of you may be aware that we advertise for businesses that might be eligible for this, looking for feedback. And I, I want to recognize town planner Danielle McKnight for her effort on that. Um, so we had asked for um, $300,000, um, hoping that we would get that. We did get $210,375, which I uh, certainly appreciate. Um, there's also a 17 and a half administ 17 and a half percent administrative fee. Um, sorry, excuse me, a 15% administrative fee, which goes to the town of Ashland, which is managing the program for all of the participants. Um, what we'll be doing is sending out um, some information to businesses that expressed interest um, and uh, otherwise trying to notify the business community once we have more information from um, the grant organizer. Um, and just to give some basic information, which we put out back in, um, I think in April or maybe early May, um, it, the grant program would, would provide up to $10,000 in financial assistance to micro enterprises, which are businesses that have five or fewer employees, one of whom is the owner of the business. Um, and there's uh, an income re requirement as well. Um, um, if your income um, is uh, low or moderate, um, then um, you, um, you may, you, you, that, that is a compliance or a, an eligibility factor and it depends upon the size of your family as well. Um, so there will be additional information that will go on the town website on this and we'll be pushing it out through social media once um, the, um, the application um, method is, uh, is nailed down. Uh, but we're pleased to be able to at least offer that as a resource for, um, for our businesses um, in addition to the other um, things that we've tried to do along the way that maybe have not been financial in nature to support them uh, in their recovery. Um, and that um, that concludes my report for this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Questions of the members? Mr. O'Leary, any questions? No, none. Thank you. Mr. Walner, any questions? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Studo, any questions? No. Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions? No. And I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you for continuing to give us these regular updates. You know, we're kind of resuming as normal business as normal and back to business as normal even though even though these virtual meetings are obviously causing us some <laughs> technical glitches but i uh you know we can forget that we're still in the pandemic as hard as that is to believe so it's helpful to be you know in regular communication with you and i appreciate that you're that you're not just updating us during these meetings, but giving us giving us in the town, members of the town, the regular updates that you are making. So we appreciate that effort on your part. Thank you, Madam Chair. So with that, we'll do old and new business. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just uh, stay cool, check on neighbors, check on each other, and uh, wear your face masks, please. You know, it's, it's a wise thing to do. And uh, everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner? Uh, just two things briefly. Um, Phil Hertz from the Land Utilization Committee who has been spearheading the rail trail. Um, he, I, I sat through a session with him about six weeks ago. He would, uh, he thinks it's, it would be a good time for him to come visit with the board to share what he's learned about the, uh, the bike trail and the situations we're facing. And I thought maybe during the summer, if we have a you know quiet time, that'd be a good time to invite him in. Um, it's a very exciting project. Um, he thoroughly knows his topic, and uh, he, he's he has good maps. We've done we did it virtually. We didn't meet in person. He can do that for us as well. So if we can squeeze him in, uh, that'd be a good thing to bring in. And then again, I'll remind as well is that you know 
um, Leanne, maybe you can get involved with this, is that 10-year recreational open space plan. It'd be nice, again, if we have some quiet time in August, um, you know, before September hits, to have them come in and tell us what's on there. It'd be really good to learn about that before, you know, we, we run out of time. I'm assuming September's going to be very busy, so. Um, right. So I think it'd be interesting to have us hear about sooner than later. Right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waldner. Mr. Sudo. Uh, no, um, it's that. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez. All set. Good. All right. I'm all set too. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> Second, motion to adjourn, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. Thank you, everybody. Good night. See you at the next one. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.